I wrote a song a few years ago inspired by a quote by another nun who didn't hear from the Lord for many years, Mother Teresa, who's going to be sainted soon, I believe. And um, I so relate. Um, I've spent most of the years since becoming Catholic in what felt, has felt like a complete and utter darkness in my life of prayer. And so in the months leading up to this conference, I've been really trying to yield myself to what has turned out to be a need for healing, um, that my prayer couldn't really progress without what Dan talked about, surgery, you know, emotional and spiritual surgery in my case. And um, so I'm here expecting to receive from the Lord just as much as I hope you guys are here expecting to receive from him. Um, I feel like I'm on pilgrimage a little bit. And I, I believe the Lord for good things this week. Um, and if you know this song, just please feel free to sing it with me. Silence of
name. I think we're going to have some prayers. There's a quote from Pope Paul VI, and he says, Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than he does to teachers. And if he listens to teachers at all, it is because they are witnesses. And as I listened to Dan speak, I said, this man is a witness to the resurrection. And this man has experienced the resurrection in his life and is experiencing the resurrection in his life. It gives me great encouragement and for many of us. And my only regret during that was like, this place should have 2,000 people in it. You know, like, I think if Catholics really learned to pray, the church would be like a wildfire. It would be like a wildfire. And this man knows how to pray. So thank you very much, Dan. And we thank God for the grace of, of God at work in your life. Um, we're going to move now to our panel. Uh, while we set the chairs up, I want you just to just take a moment and just ask the Lord or ask yourself, what did I receive from that? from that talk from Dan, because sometimes we can kind of, these things can bounce along, and we just say, oh, that was great, and I'm pumped up, and, uh, but just, let's just take a moment and just think, and then maybe turn to the person next to you, and just share what that is, so just take a couple of minutes, while we set the chairs up for our panel, have a think, and then just share, if you want, with the person next to you, what struck you from, from Dan's talk. Okay, God is good, and all the time, amen. So we're now going to uh, hear from Father Michael, Dr. Mary, and Dan, uh, just some thoughts about prayer, really. So these are questions that uh, have been submitted to us in some fashion that I've been given, um, so I'm just going to ask them and just whoever feels comfortable, feel that I want to share, uh, just so. So the first one, um, a little personal, can you share briefly the main ideas of how you connect with God on a daily basis and what you have learned in your life of prayer? Well, for me, you know, there's some things that are built already into my life as a religious, so with the liturgy of the hours and mass and uh, adoration every day. I'm living at a house of prayer, so I have a lot of, I need extra help. I think that's why the Lord gave me these things. And, um, but I think even with all that being said, almost like what Dan was saying, you know, uh, I think it moved from like duty oriented into um, kind of okay, enough ready with just like saying these prayers. Like, what is the verification? Like, what, what is happening in my life? And, where are you, Lord? And really to just have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with the Lord. Like, Lord, it's either true or not. Like, so you're true or not, Lord, and you're here before me. And so I think the movement, I think prayer, you grow. You start off, I think, with the learning of those prayers as a little child, and you know, you grow in your prayer. The verbal prayers are important, you know, and they become a jumping point. Uh, uh, but then that encounter, and then like even as Catherine Doherty would say, you know, to be able to sit down across from the Lord and have a cup of tea with him. You know, what's that discussion like as a friend? And to say, Lord, you know, and also, I think one of the things I was thinking about as well is, uh, I think initially, we tell the Lord a lot what we want him to do, you know, and really give him an opportunity to really express himself and to even be open to what he wants us to do. And that's, it. that's I think, um, a vulnerability, a vulnerability uh, in prayer to allow the Lord to speak into my life what he wants and to be able to receive, I think, is a huge part uh, that as I've grown over these years, I think receiving and connecting with the Lord and receiving to allow the Lord to speak what do you want and to be that vulnerable and then to try to respond to that, you know, as best I can. Well, my prayer life has gone through, I'm sorry about that. My prayer life has gone through various phases. And uh, for years, I, I prayed the liturgy of the hours every day. Um, 
the Lord has not led me to do that recently. And more recently, my, my prayer has sort of evolved to what is most fruitful. And that's kind of a prayer axiom. Probably Dan would know who first said it. Pray as you can, not as you can't. Somebody, somebody smart said it. <laughs> somebody smart said it. Thank you. <laughs> and so what I do currently is I, I uh, sing and pray with worship music for uh, between an hour, and, hour to two hours. Um, I just need that amount of time coming into the presence of the Lord and just giving him glory for, and thanks for who he is and, and just kind of letting his presence settle on me. I lead a very, very busy life, and the rest of my day I can feel like I'm running around like a chicken <laughs> with its head cut off. But that time in the presence of the Lord grounds me in him and, and gives me a connection with him that lasts through, through the day. And I, um, I intersperse singing and um, praising him out loud with praying in tongues. And I find the gift of prayer in tongues to be a contemplative gift, a gift even more so when I'm with a group of people in, in a prayer meeting, all singing in tongues or praying in tongues, but also when I'm alone. There's a way that it, it's the Holy Spirit praying in me in a way that goes beyond what I can pray in English. And as St. Paul says, when, when we pray in tongues, the mind is unfruitful, but the spirit is fruitful. And we're just, we're, we're connecting with God on a different level of our being. And so I find myself when I'm driving in the car, when I'm uh, about to have a conversation with somebody, and sometimes even when I'm in a conversation with somebody, praying in tongues and asking the Holy Spirit to lead me and give me insight as to how I ought to respond, how I can love this person, and, and very often he does. And then after the time of um, praising, worshiping God, uh, praying in tongues, I, of course, read scripture. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hunger for the word of God, and I sometimes listen to the daily readings. Um, I sometimes read through a book of scripture, uh, part of scripture that the Lord has uh, impressed upon me. Sometimes I follow a theme through scripture. Um, I ask the Lord to show me, you know, I'm a biblical scholar, but there's tons of passages I don't understand. And the best insights I've gotten are not from commentaries and, you know, scholarly works. It's from sitting before the Lord. And sometimes I ask him for months before I get uh, an insight. And all of a sudden, I might just read something or hear something, or he just might put it in my heart. And I, I realize, oh, that's what it means. And so that gives me a connection with the Lord, too. And um, over time, my, the percentage of time I spend asking the Lord for things has decreased. And I find that it, it, when I'm in the presence of the Lord, I don't need to spend as much time. I just, just kind of put before him the person who needs prayer, the situation that needs prayer. And it, it's more powerful than, you know, a long, wordy prayer trying to cover everything that's needed. I guess you got tired of hearing me talk. <clears throat> I've, I've kind of revealed, in a sense, what my prayer life looks like, but it's a little closer to the friars. Um, <clears throat> I get up very early, and I get up before the monkeys are all awake, because groggy monkeys rarely cause a ruckus. <laughs> so I get up when I'm groggy on purpose, because I have a very creative mind, and I'm always I'm extremely busy. I have two jobs at EWTN, and I have started a uh, university called the Avila Institute for Spiritual Theology, graduate studies. <clears throat> so, um, but busyness is never an excuse because like Mary and like fathers who also get a lot done, um, I spend probably a total of two hours in prayer a day, not including mass. So mass would be another maybe an hour. Um, but I've found, and I think this is an old prayer axiom, and it really is an act of faith that the more you pray, the more you get done. For me, I am a basket case without prayer. I, I admit that. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a complete idiot uh, without spending time with God, and so it begins with mental prayer, and that's just uh, more of a very simple, quiet time. It moves into uh, Liturgy of the Hours. I'm praying with these two every day and, and millions around the world and our sisters here. And in the Liturgy of the Hours, because I'm a lay person, I don't have to complete them by obligation, and which is a great blessing because if I, like this morning, because it's a feast day, it begins with Psalm 63, and it says, my God, you are my God, for you I long, for you my soul is thirsting, my body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water. And so I gaze upon you in the sanctuary, and I see your strength and your glory. For your love is better than life, my lips shall speak your praise. I have chills as I'm saying that. Sometimes, as I begin the Liturgy of the Hours, it goes like this. Oh God, you are my God. And then 20 minutes later or so, the Liturgy of the Hours is done for me. <laughs> because I don't have to do what you guys have to do. So um, it's the Liturgy of the Hours and then the Rosary every day. And then adoration before Mass at noon at EWTN. I'm so grateful to work at EWTN that I get to go to Mass every day. But um, the one thing I would say is uh, that busyness is a lie of the enemy. Nobody's too busy to pray. Pray to, um, oh gosh, who, uh, the farmer. What is the farmer? St. Isidore the farmer. I started to pray to him because I wanted to go to, I was working for Focus on the Family at the time. I wanted to start to go to noon mass, but I couldn't make it back and forth. And so I prayed to St. Isidore, look up the story, it's hilarious. The angels do his work for him while he's off going and praying. And so I prayed to God to let me go to, ma go to, Adder go to mass and, and, he, and he took care of everything. And then I began adoration at a half hour before mass, um, recently as an act of defiance against my unbelief as an act of defiance against my unbelief. I believe God. I have more, to, more work to do than you can ever imagine, but I know and I believe you, Lord, that without you I can do nothing. And with you, with my heart oriented to you, all the most important things will be done. Right? Yes. Right. Wonderful. Um, perhaps this is a question from people who are kind of still beginning their prayer life. A very good question. I can't pray longer than 10 to 15 minutes a day. Is there something wrong with me? Can I hit that one really quick? And then you, I want to hear it. I, you're believing. I, so this might be, con, I don't mean to be condemning, but I just have to say this. That is a lie of the devil. It's a lie of the devil. You may have trouble in prayer. Have you all had trouble in prayer? No, no. Right? Have you had trouble in prayer? <laughs> nobody, who, nobody who's ever prayed and is serious about prayer has not had trouble. Nobody has ever thought, I can't do this. I mean, everyone who has thought, I can't do this. This is too hard. You know, this is too difficult. The enemy wants you to believe, but I can't is never comes from God when it, when it comes to orienting your heart to God. When you hear that, you should rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And, and say, this is a lie from the devil, say it. I reject this lie from the devil when that comes to your head. And then you say, I affirm the truth that I can pray however long God wants me to pray and he will show me the way and ask God to help you. Amen, that's great. I'll just hit a different part of that question because I was gonna say, you know, if you feel like it's hard, too hard to pray more than 10 or 15 minutes, uh, I'd say, yeah, yeah, there's something wrong with you. It's called original sin. <laughs> Join the club. Join the club. We all resist. There's self-will in all of us. There's distraction. There's love for the world. There's love for the flesh, love for sleep, love for busyness, love for success, all these things that compete with the Lord who is first, and, and the first and great commandment is to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so um, the fact that we battle, as Dan said so beautifully earlier, is uh, intrinsic to our condition as fallen men and women. And yet we have victory because we have a savior. And he's created us for a relationship with himself. 
and there is absolutely nobody or nothing, including any wounds in yourself and issues in yourself that can keep you from that relationship if you pursue it, if you desire it. And it kept, uh, St. Therese was really big on desire, wasn't she? I mean, the, the, the main obstacle, I, I, I learned so much from this years ago, the main obstacle is that we, we don't really desire it. On one level, we do, and yet uh, on another level, we don't. And so when I learned that, I started praying, Lord, give me the desire. Give me a deeper desire for prayer. And, and sure enough, the Lord began to answer that, and it and became a, a hunger in me, you know, to the point later where I, I couldn't live. Like you said, I couldn't live without it. It, w it would be a half existence without prayer. Yeah, I was just thinking about, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about, um, too, if it's like you're having a hard time praying 15 minutes of prayer, um, then I would suggest you pray 16 minutes of prayer. <laughs> you know, because Ignatius says, you know, if we're getting there and we want to cut it short, he says, actually, just bump it just a little bit. And the breakthrough may be just right at that moment. If you right resist the point, devil, he will flee from you. And if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Right? Exactly. So the movement, the movement to make a commitment to just, just a little, boom, just a little bit more. And the breakthrough might be right there at that point. So I, I would suggest, uh, yeah. And maybe, again, as Dan talked about so beautifully in his talk, it's just the stretching your soul for greater capacity for his presence in, in these aesthetical, uh, in these struggles. You know, it's a, it's a struggle for greater capacity, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. Talking about asceticism, um, there's a question here. What has fasting or mortification to do with prayer and the spiritual life? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking about just as a joke that we have in the community as Fries of the Renewal. One of the jokes is uh, there used to be a group called the Breatharians. Um, this was a group, a heretical group that existed that so aesthetical that they gave up breathing. Of course, you don't hear about them anymore. And so, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you could use that then. <laughs> um, but yeah, asceticism, I think uh, probably when I first began with uh, and conversion, you know, jumped right into some hardcore fasting and, and just living incredibly simply and um, and that was a value because it kind of helped me rearrange my perspective on stuff. But then there were some things I would say to that that were pretty pagan because in the sense that where was God in that? And, and as I've grown kind of, I think, in the life as a friar, even like for the friars, for instance, poverty would be the big one. Well, there are a lot of poor people that I know that are not holy. So it can't be that it's poverty. It has to be something else that's deeper, that this availability to Christ and the detachment that poverty is supposed to lead us, that only Christ satisfies and that we're having experiences of Christ satisfying and showing up. So Father Emmanuel's experience of somebody offering him a ride, the availability of his poverty for Christ to show up and that person to, to be generous and then to rejoice in that mercy. But, but, uh, but I think even aesthetically, you know, just thinking about aesthetical practices, many of them, you know, we could think about fasting on bread and water, but I think things like today's day and age, like we, we've talked about busyness or technology, and to be able to do an asceticism of like, you know what, I'm going to actually take a morning of just being quiet for 15 minutes. You know, I'm going to just turn off the phone. You know, why? What does that do for us? It, it re recalculates us, if you will. It re repositions us to be attentive to the Lord. And so uh, I think with asceticism growing, I think at first, again, had that, having no experience looking at, wow, they did this, the Desert Fathers and, and even St. Francis. And then you see the adjustment even for St. Francis at the end of life where he's apologizing to his body for some severity to it. Um, so... Audrey, I think it was the last song, um, You Liberate Me, and, and I, she could say it better, if I don't say it right, forgive me, but from the bonds of a lesser love, liberate me from the bonds of a lesser love. This is, this is John of the Cross's central message, and that is that when we practice asceticism and we reject all of those things that want our attention, 
when our phones buzz, we look at it. We're, we're constantly looking at Facebook. We're constantly texting with friends. And I'm, that, I'm not talking about, an, this is not an old guy to young people talk, okay? My wife will tell you, I have had to practice asceticism related to those issues because I live in a world of spreading the gospel. And Facebook is one of the best ways to spread the gospel, in my opinion, right? About this event, people come to my events because of Facebook, you know, all of this. But I've had to, on Sundays, make it a day where there's no electronics. I've had to make sure that I do not touch an electronic device before I enter into prayer. And every time, you know, what Father said was also very profound. He said, there are poor people who are not holy. The issue is, is because you can say no to something and be poor, but it must be accompanied by a yes to God in order for you to be holy, right? Those two together are very powerful. St. John of the Cross is very much understood. He's, he's the, the, the doctor of no, right? Don't do this and don't do that and, you know, do the harder thing and get in the line and get in the slow lane in traffic, get in the long lane in the groceries, you know, get last for food, you know, let everybody else go. You know, that's John of the Cross. But every time you say no to your flesh, that is this thing in you that will take you to hell if it rules you instead of God rules you. Your flesh, your appetites for whatever it is that you love and like that is not God will take you to hell. Ascetical practice is fighting against that evil within you and overcoming it by the Holy Spirit and giving the territory that the devil, the world, and the flesh want to take from God back to God, and you come alive, and you're not enslaved. You're not enslaved to food. You're not enslaved to electronics. You're not enslaved to unhealthy relationships. You are not enslaved to money. You're not enslaved to fame. You're not enslaved to anything but God. That's true liberty, true peace, true freedom. That's what he calls us to. That's the abundant life. And asceticism, well, the contemplative life is two things, prayer and ascesis. Two things, prayer and ascesis. That's what the contemplative life is. Orienting to the heart to God and, and being constantly present to him and fighting against everything and anything that keeps you from that great love that you were made for, as Mary said. Just a little footnote, because I'm for sure the most unqualified person here to talk about fasting. I struggle with it. Um, but one thing I have learned and noticed is that fasting does not convince God to listen to our prayers. It doesn't change God. What it does is opens our ears to hear God. It, it removes the spiritual earwax. It, it removes the... Um, the incredible ties that we have to our, our flesh and to the world and therefore opens us up in a deeper way to the Lord. And so I, I see a value in it when I do it. I, I see the, the, um, the, the good fruit that comes from it. Thank you. Thank you. A couple more questions before we move into evening prayer. Um, we're here at IHOP, and we're going to see if we haven't experienced them ourselves before. Some what we call charismatic graces. You know, you're probably going to see people being slain in the spirit, or people talk about healings. Or so, is this a Catholic thing essentially? You know, can we as Catholics trust this? So, there's a question here: Have the mystics written about anything that we would call now charismatic spirituality? Have any of them experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit operating in spirit, supernatural gifts like prophecy, speaking in tongues, healings, discernment, gift of knowledge? Do you have any examples to share? How much time you got? <laughs> yeah, not much. Are the saints charismatic? Oh, you bet. You bet. It is our heritage. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit given to the church on the day of Pentecost that has never left it since then, although it's been swept under the rug at, at various times, not by the official teaching of the church, but simply by unbelief and lack of understanding and lack of experience. And I could give you just innumerable examples, and I'm sure the others could as well, of saints like 
like Teresa of Avila, who writes about praying in tongues. And she wrote about Peter of Alcantara, also somebody you mentioned, praying in tongues. And she calls it a gibberish. It was, it was not very well known back then. But she said, she said, when you hear this, don't try to stop somebody. This is, this is the Holy Spirit working in them. And saints like, like St. Saint Augustine, who earlier in his life thought that miracles and healings were only for the, the time of the apostles, and the church didn't need them, he wrote in the year 380 or something, now that the church had come to maturity. <laughs> he changed his mind after seeing so many miraculous healings take place at his own cathedral in North Africa, he couldn't deny it anymore. Saints like uh, Catherine of Siena, who raised people from the dead, prayed for victims of the plague and, and saw them get up from their sick bed. And, and there are just innumerable other examples. And so the, 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 even the idea that somehow the charismatic is less than Catholic is another lie of the devil. It, it is another vast misunderstanding that comes from the aberrations of our modern post-enlightenment culture and not from understanding anything about the history of the church and the teaching of the church because the Holy Spirit has not stopped being active since the day of Pentecost. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I, I was thinking about was that, you know, too, you could say, well, it was just back then, but when, what do you do with Padre Pio? Because here's, I mean, I had this discussion with somebody who was into the Latin mass and all and was not charismatic. And I said, okay, here's Padre Pio celebrating the Latin Mass and reading hearts at the same time. You know, so gifts are being manifested. There, there's a charismatic, it's to be Catholic. It's to be Catholic, it's the fullness. And so um, to make those distinctions, yeah, I mean, they're good to study, but I think in a broader sense, it's to be Catholic. It, it, yeah, we see it over and over again with the saints. Yeah. Thank you, and just, uh, I'll Final question, how can I be sure that what I am experiencing during my private prayer time is not simply my imagination, but God communicating with me? What are the fruits? What are the fruits? St. Teresa in the interior castle, her great work, said that the measure of the reality of your encounter with God, whether or not it's real, is love. So if you're praying, you really, in a sense, shouldn't worry about uh, the mystical experience. The, it shouldn't be central to you. It, it should be something you praise God for and you accept, but you measure your own progress or with your spiritual director, you measure progress based on are you growing in love all the time? Are you growing in love? Are the virtues more manifest in your life? You know, if those things are happening, if you're drawing closer to Christ, I can tell you the opposite side of that coin is, and this father brought up uh, St. Ignatius, and he would tell you that uh, if anything, if any mystical experience draws you away from the truths of the church, then you know those are not from God. If they draw you into sin or into vice, those are not from God. If they draw you to faith, hope, and love, as understood in the proper expression of those things in relationships and in life through the magisterium of the church, if it draws you that way, it is, you just assume it's from God and you know, you're gonna be on the right path. St. Ignatius of Loyola also has a lot of wisdom about uh, how to discern what is going on in your life and, and what's going on in your prayer. And, one of the criteria that he uses is, does it bring consolation in the sense of peace, in, a, in the sense of this is drawing me closer to the Lord, just as you said, but even, even on an immediate level? Or does it cause a kind of unrest or disturbance in my spirit and a, and a lack of peace? Not that those criteria are totally um, self-sufficient, but as you become more experienced in prayer, you, you start to be more and more aware of when the Lord is speaking, there's a certain, there's a certain feel to it. There, there's a certain peace and serenity that comes with it and a drawing of your heart to God 
whereas, you know, quote, inspirations that come from the evil one cause a disturbance in you. And, and the more you're testing them and the more you're, you're submitting to somebody uh, who is a wise spiritual director or somebody trustworthy, the more you'll grow in being able to make that discernment. Something she said is really important, it, and Mary said, is that uh, it's not in and of itself. It, it goes with, with other teachings of the church, just to be clear, because it is very important and a very misunderstood teaching of St. Ignatius. In the first rule of St. Ignatius' discernment, he talks about people going from mortal sin to mortal sin. If that is the way your life is, if you're still struggling with mortal sin, your peace will be from the devil to lead you to more sin, okay? So that's the exception that I think you were alluding to. If you're going from good to better, which is what all the rest of the rules apply to, then the Holy Spirit and the devil begin to work in different ways. The Holy Spirit, when you're going from good to better, is what Mary was talking about. You have this peace. But it's always governed by the magisterium. So if you think, if you have peace about sleeping with your boyfriend, that's a false peace, okay? This is really important, right? If you have peace for that, that means your conscience is malformed and the enemy has sown some very deep seeds of deception into your soul. Your peace, if it ever leads you away from the magisterial teachings of the church, is false and you're probably in that first rule territory. But everything else I think you said was exactly, not, not that any of it was wrong, but just to elaborate more. I don't really have much to say to that. I think it covered it, covered it well. Yeah, and I, th I think putting it before somebody who's trusted, you know, and being transparent, uh, you, because if we just, or our own gauge, we could be self-deceived. So I think the importance of the spiritual direct, the importance of somebody who's a trusted, uh, reliable sounding board for this. And, um, and I think the examine prayer, which I don't know if we want to go into, but I mean, you know, to be able to be looking at ourselves as a practice as well for our prayer uh, daily, you know, to be asking for the light and to be uh, looking at those areas of weakness on a daily basis so that we could ask for the grace to make the corrections and to choose properly and to move and grow. Yeah, the, the human person has an infinite capacity for self-delusion. If you remember that, it'll do you well. The human person has an infinite capacity for self-delusion. And the, 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 the remedy for that, St. Bernard of Clairvaux says that he who takes himself as his own spiritual director is the disciple of a fool. So don't be your own spiritual director. St. Ignatius, later in the rules, it's reflected in your heart because you've, you've engaged with it so much I, I heard in you. He said, don't. When you're wrestling with something, never keep it private. Never keep it. That doesn't mean you go gossip about it and tell everybody. But you tell someone uh, like the folks who are sitting here who can help you discern what's going on. And when the enemy is exposed, he doesn't like light. He runs. And clarity and truth come to the surface. But when you're in desolation and you're struggling, the enemy's voice, St. Ignatius reveals, is very loud and strong. And God's voice is very hard to hear. And you've got to work through those things. But the rules of discernment, the examined prayer, that's all very powerful. And just to give a plug at the Avil Institute, I'm teaching a course on discernment of spirits this year. We'd love to have you join us. It's all online. So we have students from 25 countries logging in to take these courses and to learn what we're talking about. So is that okay that I did that plug, Key? That's fine. That's okay. Just before we wrap up, any... If you could give one piece of advice to someone struggling to pray in one minute, what would it be from each of you? Never, 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 never give up. You took mine. <laughs> I guess I'll add to that. Um, spend the majority of your time, or at least more time than you do anything else in prayer, praising glorifying, thanking, worshiping the Lord. Yeah, I, I don't know. The thing that comes to heart would be uh, to let God love you, to let God save you, let God deliver you, allow him, give him permission to do that. Thank you. If we can thank our panel for a wonderful insight. <laughs>